What is going on guys? Jason Burke here, Stars Clash for Life, coming at you on YouTube, and today I've got some football focus. I've been covering the Pittsburgh Steelers all offseason, from draft to needs to free agency to undrafted free agents, and now we are through minicamp. This is the biggest lag between now and the season, but we are seeing kind of who's panning out, who could be a future roster member, and I've been taking a look at deep dives positionally at all the big spots and comparing last year to this year. Have we improved or gotten you know gotten better or worse? Who have we gotten rid of? Who have we added? I've done this for the inside linebacker spot, d uh, defensive tackle, offensive tackle, uh, or, or D-line, O-line, corner. I've done a lot of those breakdowns, so go check out all those videos. But I wanted to come back this week with another one. I apologize for the delay. I have not posted all week. It's the first time I haven't posted in a week in a while. Um, I just finished a movie of mine. I just shot uh, a horror film that I wrote, directed, and produced this past weekend. And then I got a cold when I came back off of set, so I've been a little sick for the last couple days. So Keep in touch with my upcoming horror movie. If you guys want to see updates on that, let me know. But in the meantime, I do want to cover, uh, as sick as I am, so I'll do this quickly, I wanted to talk about three players on offense and three players on defense that um, really have something to prove and need to step up this year in order for the team to be what we expect them to be. So there's been a lot of hype on how good the Steelers can be and how good the roster is and what all these upgrades mean and Omar Khan and all this Andy Weidel and all the additions they've made. So I wanted to look at three players on both sides of the ball that really need to kind of prove themselves and play big this year and, and make a big leap in order for the team to be as successful as we expect them to be. Today I'm going to cover offense uh, backwards from three to one. So I'm, I'm starting with uh, three and I'm counting up to the number one person at that position. So we'll see what you guys think about that. So starting at number three, um, say what you will about this player, and I certainly have on this channel before, number three for me on offense is Chooks Okorfor. So now you guys know my feelings on Chooks. Um, I, I wouldn't have had him re-signed. Uh, he he re-signed uh, last offseason for a three-year deal uh, that's kind of backloaded, uh, so they kind of want to see what he would do. Uh, and, and I will say, I, I will give Chooks credit. He definitely had his best season this past year. Uh, although I still don't think it was great, I still think the line struggled quite a bit, especially early in the season, but he stayed healthy and he helped to gel and he did get better in the second half of the season. And this by far was an improvement for him, even if that doesn't mean a ton in terms of the overall uh, depth of the NFL offensive lines. But I think Chooks did get better uh, this year. And so this is going to be kind of a big step for him because around him now, we have brought in four new starters around Chooks. Chooks is the one guy that has now stayed as a starter on this team coming into this year. And, and that, you know, obviously uh, last year in the offseason, we, we brought in James Daniels, who was one of the best guards in the uh, free agency market. We brought over Mason Cole, who is an underrated center who played pretty well for us last year. And then this offseason, we picked up Isaac Sayamalu, who's one of the best guards available in this year's free agency. And we traded up to draft the freakish athletic tackle Broderick Jones. So now all of a sudden you've got four new starters on top of the fact that we also signed LaRaven Clark as a free agent tackle. Uh, we signed uh, Nick Herbig as kind of a guard center swing back up from Philadelphia. So we've brought in we uh, Spencer Anderson, who played all five starting spots on the Maryland offensive line in college as a seventh round draft pick. So we've got new signings, new rookies, new depth. We've got guys from last year, guys from this year. And Shooks is the one guy that's going to remain uh, come, you know, midseason, still as a starter for this team uh, on the on the starting five compared to two years ago. So again, uh, he doesn't have as much to lose because he has one more year on his contract, and he did come off his best year last year. But this offensive line started to gel at the end of the year, and the running game got better. And again, you have a situation where Kenny Pickett is a young quarterback. He needs time to throw. Najee Harris showed uh, in spots in both of his first two seasons that he can be an elite player, but he's also shown that he needs help with the offensive line to get there. So uh, both those things need to gel, and for, the, for those to happen, the offensive line is the spot to do it. Now, Dan Moore could be an obvious pick here. And you guys know that I, I did not like Dan Moore's preseason last year. I almost would have cut him. I didn't like his, uh, his season overall last year as a starter. I think he was by far the worst of the five starters. But now it looks like, you know, by at least week four, if not by week one, that Broderick Jones is going to be our new starter there. We, we traded up to draft a guy in his position. So I don't think Dan Moore um, plays very much this year. You know, Tomlin does like to start vets over rookies on the depth chart, at least at first. Uh, but I don't think it's going to take Broderick Jones 
long to start there, especially trading up in the first round to get him. So uh, Dan Moore's on the bench now. So the starter with the most pressure to me immediately out of the gate is going to be Chooks Okor for. Number two. Now, most of you guys are going to be saying, oh, it's got to be Kenny Pickett, right? Kenny Pickett was a first-round quarterback. We have to see what he has. Yes, we do. But I don't think Kenny Pickett has the most pressure right now. Obviously, the quarterback is the leader, and he has to play well for us to play well. But considering kind of where the, the fans' expectations for Pickett were coming into last year, and the fact that in his rookie season he did finish the year 7-1 and one in his last eight starts – Coming off a concussion, he did have two game-winning touchdown drives against uh, Las Vegas and Baltimore, I believe. He looked really good for a year one starter, especially with a janky line at times, no run game at times, and you know a depleted wide receiver core at times, and an offensive coordinator at times who struggled. So I'm not going to put Kenny Pickett on this list, but I'm going to put two guys at number two and one who can help Kenny Pickett or, or hurt Kenny Pickett depending on how they play this year. So number two for me is Najee Harris. Now, don't get it twisted. I am on the Najee Harris hype train. I was a big fan of Najee coming out of Alabama. I think he's an incredibly hard runner. I think he's a good finisher. I like what he brings to the table. He's got intensity. He's a Steelers-style running back. He's got that pure power. He's got underrated speed. I like Najee Harris a lot. Um, But in both of his first two years, he's shown that, that he's not always the most consistent. I think most of that has to do with the play calls, and especially the offensive line. Now, Najee Najee had a very good rookie year in spite of having kind of a slower, weaker team around him. And then last year, he started very slow, and all the naysayers start coming out saying, okay, Najee's not a very good player. And then by the end of the year, now we're starting to hear a lot of like, well, he's a good good back, but he's not a great back. He's definitely a starter in the league, but he's not going to be an elite guy. He's not going to be a franchise kind of guy. I think he can be a franchise kind of guy. And I like what I've seen from Najee in his rookie year and the second half of last season, which was most of the offense. But also, I think that he can go much higher. I don't think we've seen the best of Najee Harris just yet. And now, again, adding two linemen last year, adding two linemen this year with the freakish Broderick Jones, adding a freakish tight end blocker as well in Darnell Washington. You know, putting Connor Hayward possibly back there at fullback now. So you've got another big athletic guy coming in front of Najee Harris. I think this sets up, if the play calling is right and if the line gels together quickly with these new faces, I think Najee can be an elite back, but he's got to prove that. You've got to finish your run strong. He's got to hit the hole. He looked a little hesitant to start last year. I didn't like the first half of last year for him because he looked a little slow. He looked a little hesitant. I know part of that was like coming in a little banged up, but I think he has to be decisive, hit the hole, and even if there's nothing there, just run hard and fall forward. You've got to turn those one and two yard gains into three and four yard gains because then all of a sudden you're opening the playbook for Kenny Pickett on on second and medium or third and short. Pickett can run, Warren can run, you can hand off to Hayward. You can do a million things when you're in third and short and second and long or second and medium opens up playbooks to play actions and things like that. So Najee just has to be decisive and he has to fall forward because those one or two extra yards are going to take a lot of pressure off picking in the offense and give our play calling a lot more opportunities to do more different things, which Canada likes to do. And we hope that he does them well this year. He's probably the biggest X factor, but I'm only counting players in the offense for this video. And the number one X factor The number one kind of guy that has something to prove in a way and has to step up for this offense to be a dynamic elite potential offense. We need people downfield to get separation and to catch the ball in traffic. We need guys to get open and guys to make tough catches. That's what bails your quarterback out, especially when they have to get rid of the ball quickly or if the running game is not working. So again, we need all three things to gel. We need the line, which is Chooks. We need Najee Harris, but we need wide receivers to get separation and to make tough catches. We've seen that now from George Pickens. We know he can make tough one-on-one catches. He doesn't even get separation. He just goes down the sidelines. He uses his body to get separation by a few inches. He uses his hands to go up and catch. He high points the ball well, and he toe taps on the sidelines well. So he's a dynamic deep threat, even without separation. The guy's got crazy physicality and crazy hands, and I think he's going to be elite this year. Another guy we saw with a lot of nice bailout catches across the middle of the field was Pat Fryermuth. 
Uh, he missed the last couple of games uh, last season, but when he's in there, he's a guy not getting a ton of separation, but making a ton of nice hands catches over the middle. Big physical guy, can catch the ball, underrated athletically. I like him a lot. Connor Hayward did the same thing for a few games when uh, Fryermuth went down, and now we know Darnell Washington is known for those big, tough catches at Georgia, that big physicality, that big body, the athletic guy that can jump over guys. We have another guy now in Washington that can do that. Who's the guy I haven't talked about yet? It's not going to be the obvious one. It's not Calvin Austin. He's still a rookie. He's just getting healthy and playing for the first time. It's Deontay Johnson. Number one, most to prove on offense, Deontay Johnson. We've seen... His route running can be among the elites. He's one of the best route runners in the NFL. He gets some of the most separation in the NFL. This is what is going to separate him. Because, again, Washington is a a, a catching traffic guy. Same with Hayward. Same with Fryermuth. Same with Pickens. They catch without separation. Deontay can get separation. And Deontay has potentially got more speed than anybody on this offense, except for probably Jalen Warren, maybe, and definitely Calvin Austin. But Deontay has got speed on top of the fact that he can run routes and use his footwork to get separation. What he's got to do now is make those catches. He can come out sometimes, especially in the first couple of weeks of the year, and make really incredible catches, back of the end zone type stuff. And then he starts to drop the easy ones. And and he's one of those guys that gets in his own head. Once he drops one, it's two, three, four. And now by the end of the year, for the last three years, he's wound up as one of the the league leaders in drops. What, What separates him from a peak Antonio Brown, is after he gets that separation or runs that clean route, he drops the easy ones. He can make some hard catches, but he's not consistent at all. And when you've got a young quarterback, and you've got a potentially inept offensive coordinator, and you've got a line who's trying to gel and got new pieces, and again, now you're adding Calvin Austin, now you're adding Darnell Washington. These are quick, like in Washington's case, strong, and in, in Calvin Austin's uh, case, fast. You're adding freak athletes and new dynamic pieces to the offense. All that's missing is that consistency. You've got to gel on routes, and you've got to catch the ball when you're open. And the one person who's shown so far they haven't been able to consistently do that is Deontay Johnson. He did it early on when he had somebody across from him. Now you're going to have a lot of guys out there. You're adding Allen Robinson, who's a veteran too, who can make tough catches. If Deontay can make those catches with the separation and speed that he gets, and he can combine his technical aspects and stay out of his head, making those catches, that's going to set up more plays downfield. Again, you've got the middle of the field now with Washington. You've got Allen Robinson who can do multiple things. Calvin Austin can be a gadget and return guy. He can get involved as a receiver. You're adding all these pieces to a line that now has another good veteran in Sayamalu and a freakish rookie in Broderick Jones. What you need now is consistency. If your rookie is getting pressured or making bad throws, you need guys that can bail him out. And if Deontay can play as peak Deontay and stay out of his head, this offense can be elite. Tell me in the comments below what you think of those three guys that I named. And of course, the X factor that that I didn't name in the offensive coordinator, Matt Canada. You guys know it comes down to him a lot as well. Tell me your comments down below about the three guys that I mentioned. Did I miss anybody? Is there anybody you think has more to prove or needs to make a bigger leap for this offense to succeed? Did I leave anybody out? And what do you think of these three? Please like, share, and subscribe this video. And again, if you want to see my other Steelers coverage, check that out on this channel. If you want updates on my horror movie called What Scares You, uh, I will give those as well. If you want more film reviews, Tell me about those also. And I'm posting a video in the next couple of days, hopefully, about the three big X-Factor improvement guys on defense. So stay tuned to that, and I will see you guys soon.